everyone and welcome to our Good Friday service together. Shall I pray as we begin? Heavenly Father, how we praise you that on that uh, Good Friday, uh, Jesus died in the place of sinners. Please would we learn to appreciate him more today. Would you delight our hearts with him so that we uh, rejoice this Easter as indeed uh, your people have done down through the ages, this most important uh, weekend in our year. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, you have to wonder how John de Canefield felt. The year is 1349, September to be exact. And John has just been installed as the vicar of St Michael's Wilmington in Kent. The plague has ravished the country. And the parish of St Michael's had been badly hit. As John took up his new appointment, he would not have been encouraged to hear that the congregation had already buried two vicars that spring and summer. And when John too succumbed to the plague before Christmas, you do really have to wonder what was going through the mind of Robert de Londine, uh, the fourth vicar inside a year. Would you have gone to work in Wilmington as they did? Or perhaps you're familiar with the story of Jim Elliot, who spent years with four colleagues preparing to take the gospel to the cannibalistic Haurani people in Ecuador. And they landed and were martyred within days. I wonder, as I tell those stories, what's your first response? Perhaps something inside us screams out, what a waste! Perhaps you admire those men whilst also secretly making a mental note never to visit Ecuador or indeed Kent. Whatever your gut reactions are, they would seem to be acts of extraordinary bravery, wouldn't they? And we might doubt that we would ever be able to or willing to make such sacrifices ourselves. Our passage this morning has just such a sacrifice in it. Just listen to these words of the Apostle Paul. For whose sake... I have lost all things. You certainly say, wouldn't you, that John de Canefield lost all things, dying of the plague. So did Jim Elliot and his friends. Uh, Paul is still alive at this point, but he's in prison. He's been deprived of his liberty. And as chapter one reminded us, Paul has at least a reasonable expectation of being martyred himself, as in fact he was just a few years later. Paul has been robbed and flogged and beaten and stoned and shipwrecked three times. He's been disowned by his kinsmen and disowned by his friends. He was repeatedly thrown into prison. Paul's was not an easy life. And you'd have to say that Paul brought it upon himself. He had all the pedigree and the privileges and the training to be a highly respected Jewish leader, a protected religion in the Roman world. Uh, The cost of following Jesus seems to be absurdly, astronomically high, doesn't it? At least for those men. You ought to at least ask this question, what on earth possessed them? What madness is this? But there actually is another question we ought to ask, a more uncomfortable question perhaps. Uh, One which chapter 4 verse 11 will force upon us, for Paul says these words in that chapter. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. And again and again through the letter, Paul tells us to rejoice. So what on earth possessed Paul, John and Jim, which gets dangerously close to to being the Beatles, doesn't it? What, What possessed Paul, John and Jim so that they would bear such a loss of all things with joy? And then perhaps we might ask the more personal question. Wouldn't you want a joy and contentment that endures in every situation? How content are you feeling in the midst of the uncertainty of the coronavirus lockdown at the moment? So perhaps there is a better question for us. What if the loss of everything was the price you had to pay for genuine contentment and joy? Does that seem to be too high a price to pay? If Jim, John and Paul seem odd to us, in being willing to suffer the loss of all things. It's not a problem with them, but with us. We have failed to understand something fundamental to Christianity that they clearly all grasped. So this morning, we're going to see that being a Christian may cost you everything you have. There's no point pretending otherwise. 
It may cost you everything, and it is infinitely worth it. But we're also going to see that the benefits of being a Christian are, are not bought or earned, but freely given by a generous father. That's the meaning of Good Friday. That's why we, we call the day that our king was murdered good. Now, if that sounds paradoxical to you, then it is but one of many paradoxical things in the Gospels. And this one we can hope to clear up for you a little bit this morning. So let's begin uh, by understanding why Paul is willing to suffer. So let's think about the loss that he talks about in verse 8. Uh, what I think is crucial here is to understand the decision that Paul made before he lost all things. See, back in verse 7 uh, in uh, Sunday's passage, Paul introduced us to the idea of profits and losses. Paul invited us to conduct, conduct some sort of spiritual audit, to look carefully at what really matters and to value it accordingly. Paul used uh, to value his religious liberty, his identity, his works. He thought those things were precious because they earned him a place in God's kingdom. They were on the profit side. When Paul met the risen Lord Jesus, his world was turned upside down. He suddenly realised that all these things that he thought were important were in fact keeping him away from God. They were worse than dangerous. They, they got quickly put onto the lost side of the ledger. Spiritually speaking, all these things that he thought were, uh, were profitable, he now came to realise were, were lost, were, were less than nothing. They were an obstacle. And in verse 8, Paul moves beyond his religious activity to say not only were his religious identity and actions a loss, but everything is a loss. Verse 8, what is more, I consider everything a loss. It's not that his home is worth it, it isn't that his reputation has no value. It's certainly not that his Roman citizenship was meaningless. People paid an awful lot of money to be made Roman citizens. Rather, Paul makes a comparative point. He, he compares all of those things to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, verse 8. And by comparison, he finds them to be of very little value. So imagine if I offered you £100. No strings attached, you can have £100. I'm not going to give you £100. Don't come and ask for £100. I don't have lots of hundreds of pounds to give out. But imagine that I did. But then... With the other hand, I offered you a million pounds. You don't want all the other. See, so it's not that a hundred pounds has no value. But compared to a million pounds, it's next to worthless, isn't it? Paul has discovered the pearl of great price. And recognising how precious Jesus is, he's instantly willing to make the right value judgment about everything else. He's so transfixed by the beauty of Jesus that everything in his world became dull by comparison. And I want you to see this mental step, this bit of mental accounting is very important. It's a step that many of us forget to make the way Paul did when we start our Christian lives. Perhaps we've never been told about the cost of following Jesus. And so we, we never actually make that step. And that's a shame because this is the step that helps us to grow more fully into the likeness of Christ with every day that passes. Do you remember back in chapter 2, verse 4, uh, Paul wanted us to have the mind of Christ. Well, this is what the mind of Christ looks like. Jesus encouraged people to count the cost of the Christian life before they begin. Some of us weren't told about the cost. If you're just looking into Christian things at this point and perhaps you're a bit scared by the idea of a cost, please hear this the way it's meant to be heard. I don't want to hide from you that it might cost you everything to follow Jesus. Because I don't want to deprive you of Paul's joyful contentment in following Christ that otherwise might be a struggle for you. See, when Paul lost all things, it didn't matter because in his head, mentally, he'd already set them aside. He'd already decided that they weren't worth anything. If only stole your hundred pounds, but you'd just been given a million pounds, you, you'd have much less of a problem with it than if you didn't have the million pounds, you see. Paul had already determined that they were of little value, and so they were dispensable. But did you notice the end of verse 8, the, the word Paul uses there? He says, I consider them garbage. Some translations say dung. 
both, I think, are being a little bit too polite. Paul considers everything except Jesus to be poo. Now, you don't keep your poos unless you're very odd. You flush them away, or in Paul's day, you throw them away. They're disposable. That's the point. We aren't distressed when we lose our poos. And Paul wasn't at all distressed when he lost all things because they didn't matter to him at all. His loss didn't feel like a loss because he'd already mentally set them aside. Didn't disturb his joy, didn't disturb his contentment at all. So here is the challenge for you or I. Could you meet Paul's fate with contentment and rejoicing? Would you be willing to go to the Harani people knowing they might eat you for breakfast? If not, why not? I'm not saying Jesus is calling you to do that. He's calling very few of us to do that. But he is calling us to take up our cross and follow him. And this really matters. Thinking like Paul is not really optional for Christians. Jim, John and Paul, they got that, didn't they? We can get lulled into thinking like this, can't we? Following Jesus is great. I want to get to glory. I want to have all the things that come from Jesus, but I don't want it to hurt too much. I'm going to hold back because I don't want to be uh, to suffer. So we won't go to the ends of the earth because we'd be away from friends or family or, or decent health care. Of course, we'll, we'll admire those who go. We'll pray for our mission partners. But would we want our children to do that? Perhaps a little closer to home. Are we willing to be identified as Christians? Perhaps at school, you're not that comfortable telling your friends about your faith in Jesus because you know people would laugh or mock you or or, or treat your reputation poorly. See, when we value those things too highly, they prevent us from living like Paul, like Jesus because we fail to make the right value judgment about those things. To look at Jesus as worth infinitely more than everything else in this world combined is absolutely essential to us living like Christ, as we're called to do. And if we're to be powerfully transformed by Jesus, we need to make that value judgment. We've got to be willing to count the cost and find it worth it. Whether Jesus ever asks us to pay it or not, we have to mentally make that decision. That's what we're going to spend the rest of the service doing, delighting in the pearl of great price, Jesus, so that we're willing that little bit more to give up everything for Christ. But before we uh, stop to sing again, I I want to just dwell on two things as, as we pass. First, if you're not yet a Christian, please don't dismiss Paul too quickly here. He he suffered greatly and he thinks that the teaching he's bringing us here is is really good news for the church. And this talk of a great cost can be off-putting, can't it? But please wait until you hear the rest of the service to make up your mind. And secondly, I wonder whether the contentment Paul has might not be something that we would aspire to as well in these anxious and troubled times. Might we be willing to consider Paul's teaching a bit more seriously this morning? Because we want what Paul had. Uh, We're going to sing a song. We're going to sing uh, Blessed Be Your Name, a song that recognises that God is worth it in the good times and also in the very difficult times. And it could be a song for our times, couldn't it?